So this, as I said, I'm going to demystify a little bit about how do you work with GCF. Just for context setting, for those of you who don't know yet, we were set up by the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, as a financing mechanism. And we play a very important role under the Paris Agreement for the developing countries to meet their targets for mitigation and adaptation. We are the largest dedicated climate fund in the world. We have so far committed over $12 billion, of which $3.5 $4.5 billion have been through the private sector. And we are serving as the hub of the climate finance architecture. As you heard from one of our opening speakers today, Alexia Lethordu, she's thrown us a challenge to not just be one of the, speak, one of the players in that uh, climate architecture, but actually play a more convening role to play a more full role there. And you'll see more of us. these slides, so please don't dwell on it. Just showcase that what we have done so far is just a little glimpse into what we can do into the future. Our board has adopted the updated strategic plan for 2024 to 2027. We work in four-year strategic blocks, so we've just completed us, we will be completing a second strategic block by the end of this year. There's one more board uh, in October left to go will be approving some projects. But henceforth, 2024 onwards, these are the mandates that our board has set us up for. For the first block that you see on top, there are five transition areas, and these transition areas come from uh, the IPCC report. And the board has set us very specific mandates on where we should be focusing on mostly new countries which haven't received our funding so far. At food security and human resilience being one of the primary ones, followed by ecosystem and nature's transition, climate resilient and low emission infrastructure, clean energy, the energy transition on the supply side, and then on the demand side. These are the five areas where both our sister operations department on the public sector side as well as ourselves, we will be focusing a significant part of our investment and pipeline building on. A specific mandate has been set by our board for the private sector, that is us, which is on early stage venture financing, as well as on greening the financial system. So working with the developing countries, local financial institutions, in enabling them to become greener themselves and also enabling them to access more green capital. So before I come to this, what does that mean in practical numbers? In practical numbers, the board has set us a target to be at a baseline of at least 35% in nominal value of investments, of the total investment that we will do in a strategic period of 2024 to 2027. That might roughly mean about a billion dollars a year if our replenishment goes well. So who can then work with us? We work, we are a partnership agency, as Mafalda mentioned in the morning, we work through accredited entities. Up until last year, that was the only mode through which anybody who wanted to access GCF financing could work with us. But this year in April, we launched another mode, and that's called the project-specific approach. So typically the way it happens is that we, our accredited entity brings us a proposal, and then we work within our system, and I'll go into the details, to, to be able to then move it towards impact. We also have a grant window called the Readiness Grant Support. And tomorrow we have uh, our deputy director from the dev And tomorrow we have our deputy director from the Division of Country Programming who will talk a little bit more about how to access that for our direct access entities and for also our other accredited entities and partners to receive capacity building support. So we are one of the uh, only few funds that actually will build the capacity of our partners to be able to improve their own systems internally and as well as to be able to do the projects more efficiently. 
We also have a project preparation facility. As I mentioned in the morning today, uh, both CRDB's project as well as the Ajit Arivafa uh, announcement that I made have received project preparation facility grant that enables the entity to develop a project based on GCF's requirement and bring a high quality bankable project to us, which then we go through our system. Our accredited entities can do the project themselves, or sometimes they partner with another entity called an executing entity. Sometimes in a fund situation, it could be the uh, fund manager, or it could be other partners such as a specialty institution that might provide technical assistance, or let's say um, somebody who's able to design an insurance product or something, whereas the large bulk of the project might be different. So that's uh, an executing entity. We also have implementing partners, which are service providers on the ground. As I mentioned up until now, the only way to work with GCF was through our accredited entity. Our team would normally receive either cold calls or through events such as this, Greg get some ideas, and we would try to, as honest brokers, match make with our accredited entities. Uh, some organizations already have established relationship and they look at our accredited entity list on our website and they form partnership and they come to us. But from April of this year onwards, we have now launched a new window called the Project Specific Accreditation Approach, which now for the first time allows a developer, promoter, a fund manager to directly come to GCF to get funding. And that's a very, very exciting opportunity for the private sector, definitely. And I have my colleague, Tim Breitbart, tomorrow who will be talking about it. So those of you who are interested in that, please do attend that session. As I mentioned, these are the two approaches through which uh, we work. The accredited entity route is an institutional accreditation route. What does that mean? That means uh, we, that entity is interested in becoming a long-term partner and will become a pipeline developer for us, we would expect an accredited entity or an institutional entity, institutional partner entity to bring to us two to three projects at least every year. That doesn't often happen, but that, that would be our expectation. If you go through that, in that process, the GCF has an accreditation panel which reports directly to the board of the GCF. And they do a GCF mandated accreditation uh, assurance, which includes fiduciary standards, environmental and social safeguards, and all sorts of other assessment. And then the secretariat level, me and my colleagues and others, we just look at the project. Once you have received the accreditation, that accreditation also includes a fiduciary uh, assessment of what is the capacity of the institution, which type of financing instruments, what size of projects can you undertake, what type of environmental and social security risks that you could take. And based on that, the accreditation is approved, after which then we move to the project assessment and funding. Given that that takes a longer time, based on the demand from the field, our board approved the project-specific accreditation approach last year, and we've launched it this year, and that will cut short the process, where we don't do the institutional level assessment for all the fiduciary standards and compliance standards. But those would be done only at the project level. Whether the entity to whom we will be providing the finance would be able to meet with the GCF requirements for the project. So you may not have at an institutional level a policy on XYZ, but if for the project, if you are willing to put together that standard and ring fence GCF and the project, then that would be something that would be assessed. And that hopefully will uh, start the process. We have about 10 applicants this year and we will be moving forward. Hopefully if the pilot is successful, this will become a permanent feature. So once you have an accreditation with us and you have developed a proposal, what do we look for? My first thing would be don't develop a proposal because what we look for is pretty intense. So before you start developing a proposal, my entity, my request here to everybody who is thinking about working with us is talk to one of me or my colleagues. That is the, that single conversation will save you months and months of effort. And that will also help us co-create something that is needed on the ground because we are a country-driven organization. 
we are, our country, uh, Division of Country Programming and us work together very closely. We know what the countries want. We at least have a good feel for what their priorities are. So we could help you direct that. And that conversation, and then we have our board priorities. So that conversation helps then frame it in a manner that addresses your concerns and needs, your priorities as well as ours. Once you have that, we have a variety of areas through which the board requires us to measure the work that we do. We have eight results area. As you can see, four of them are mitigation orientated, which are easier to measure. About 20 years of experience doing renewable uh, in the industry, uh, plus deforestation um, and, and transport now, and uh, building and appliances. However, there are four areas that we work on which are adaptation and resilience related. It's a more uh, difficult area for us. We recognize that. But we are the only ones who are doing that at scale right now. And we have learned some lesson. We have a special side session tomorrow again, uh, which one of my peers, uh, director for the uh, Division of Pro Portfolio Management, Lillian Macharia, will be talking about measuring impact uh, on the adaptation side. We have a very, very well-developed framework called the Integrated Results Management Framework with detailed methodology. If you haven't looked at it, I'd request you to do that and also listen to Lillian tomorrow. Uh, that enables us then to bring together a very high quality proposal. The other thing to note is that we are not like other DFIs. We are a climate first entity. So we look for climate impact. We are a high risk for climate impact fund. We are a patient capital and what our purpose is to be able to invest where the climate impact is the highest and enable, especially on the private sector side, enable them to then move towards commerciality because by itself, without our funding, it may not be. And that's the critical part, which is then additionality of GCF. Why is GCF needed? Our capital is scarce. We want to target those where GCF is needed. If something cannot happen without GCF and has high climate impact potential, that's where we will come in. The other areas to uh, look at is that we are not just an institution in terms of our fiduciary compliance responsibilities uh, and uh, on especially environmental and social safeguard and others. We don't just believe in do no harm. Our frameworks encourage to do good. So even though we are climate first and we look at climate impact as our sole reason for looking at additionality and so on and so forth, we also want it to do good for the countries. It is low emission, climate resilient development pathways. We're wanting, our, our requirement is to help countries change their trajectory of development and not adopt the past trajectories which were high emission, low climate resilient. So changing the pathway is then about creating sustainable development in the countries themselves. Environmental and social risk, um, um, social safeguard, risk management, um, m and &E, gender, uh, and legal standards. These are compliance requirements, but very often these are also create, these also create some of these, especially on the ESS and gender, create actually good investment opportunities as well. Uh, we look at six investment criteria and there are details available on this. I won't dwell on it today, but if any of you have um, any questions about it, me and my colleagues are around, happy to answer. Each of these investment criteria have sub-criteria under them and have measures attached to them. And we could talk about it later. So what's, what do we do with our fund? Uh, as was mentioned so many times by, by examples, we de-risk. We are a patient capital, but we are a catalytic capital. Our reason for existence is to de-risk private capital for climate. But we do that with minimum concessionality. We don't want to distort markets. So arriving at that conclusion is sometimes an art, sometimes a science. We start with economic and financial models, but what the final numbers that we agree to or come together is flexible, depends on the needs of the country, depends on the project that you're trying to do, depends on how far the money needs to go and what it would impact and what it would achieve. We offset risks and other market barriers and impediments. That's what we look. The more precise you can be, we don't need theses. The more precise you can be, the better it is for us to assess that. 
And of course, as I said, encourage high impact climate investment. We are market makers. What, what does that mean? Uh, as as Araf talked about and others, very often you will see, after sometimes we are, we were the first one to have done that. And that's what we would like to do. But we'd also do scaling up. Because very often, if you've done one off or two off, it doesn't help. It hasn't yet created the market knowledge and the data points people need to be able to make the investments after us. So we do scaling up as well. But we would play a very catalytic role there, which means we would like you to you know, paint a picture for us of where the risks are the highest. And we would take that chunk of it, rest of it, rest of the value chain of the investment that has already been de-risked. We do not want to be playing there. There are other players better than us, bigger than us, who can play that role. And we, as was mentioned again multiple times, we, have, we are capital agnostic. We have multiple different instruments. Depending on the needs of it, we can structure it very well. Many of my colleagues are here. I think about 12 of them today are here, and there are several back home as well. Talk to them. We will help you design the best structure that's possible to achieve the highest impact at the most, at the least, concessionality. This wonderful, beautiful uh, project cycle is a work of art. <laughs> and as some of my colleagues say that it's not a cycle, actually, it's a linear process. Agreed. But a project cycle, it starts for us, for our purposes, which means on the investment side, at the concept node stage. Origination is mostly through conversations. The more people we meet, the more we talk, the better our origination is. Events such as this is uh, useful. Our colleagues attend other events. Uh, we also partner with many other organizations who do catalytic or small-scale pilots or proof of concepts. So that becomes an uh, input into our pipeline as well. As I said again, though the concept note submission is the start of our formal process, that's when you get registered as an interested party looking for investment from us on our system, please do not submit us a concept note unless you've spoken to some of us. Uh, otherwise, it's a very, very frustrating journey. Uh, very often, many people who have worked with uh, other DFIs expect us to be, you know, somewhat the same with maybe, you know, a different color jacket, but we are not. We're really very different. So please do talk to us before that. And then at the concept note, we have our investment committees. Uh, essentially, the first level of due diligence is done internally within the private sector facility of whether that meets our you know, strategic goals or requirements for climates, et cetera. And once it passes our due diligence internally, we will then prepare it to be presented to our investment committee first level. Once that passes, we then move it to a funding proposal, which is much more detailed, which is a, a very, very detailed due diligence then ensues from all multiple criteria that I spoke about in the earlier slide, including all compliance and fiduciary standards, uh, as well as uh, legal contractual issues. Then we take it to our board, of course, signature commitment, and then voila, hopefully impact. No, definitely impact, not hopefully impact. That's where I will end today now. I'm happy to take questions. This is just a quick snapshot, one-on-one, on how to do business with us. There's a lot more on our website. Many of my colleagues are here who can answer. But better still, many of our DAE and IE colleagues are in the room. Please do enter into conversations. And our processes may not be perfect, but the work that we're doing has not been around for very long. This is just eight years, and we are, st we are only among the very few who are doing this work at this scale. We're learning together with you, and if you have better ideas too for us, please come to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Adam Armion, and I am the director of partnership of AECF. We are an African nonprofit fund manager investing in SMEs, uh, especially in fragile contexts for climate resilience. And uh, my question is on the specific, specific programs. What type of entity are you um, are eligible to, to apply for specific programs? And what do you want to see there? 
Are you trying to source a different type of partners, maybe more local or um, more, Af you know, African if it's in the region? Or, yeah, please, maybe you can shed some light on, on this. Thank you. A very, very good question. Um, yes, our mandate is to work. With, we are among the very few, I think, international financial institutions that also works directly with local entities. Uh, currently, we have about um, about 20% of our funding going through direct access entities, as we call them. We want to increase that in our second, uh, in our next strategic period. So we do look at uh, what we call uh, local entities, regional entities, as well as international entities. Um, our partners currently include from small not-for-profit grant-making institution to large international commercial investment banks. So we have a wide range of partners that we work with. Uh, it uh, mostly depends on the country and what the country priorities are. For our local entities, the government of that country has uh, NDA, our national designated authority for GCF, who nominates them. So oftentimes, if there is an entity who's interested in working with us from a local level, we will, together with our division of country programming, uh, facilitate a conversation with the NDA, the National Des Designated Authority, and look at your portfolio, what your areas of interest are, and uh, sort of advise you on what would be the right approach to uh, process further. Hopefully that answers your question. All right. Any, any other question? There's a question here in this table, and there's one in the back. I'll take the lady first and the one behind. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you for the presentation. I'll definitely meet one of you later for many of the questions I have. But for now, I want to understand what you mean by concept. Because sometimes one of us will wish to table an ongoing project. So can that be tabled as a concept? in your context? Well, in GCF's context, um, a concept note, uh, we're looking for what climate problem are you going to solve, what impact it will have, how do you wish to solve, and how would GCF's money be used to do that? Uh, we have a template around it. But very often, we do scaling up as well. So if you have a small project that has worked successfully, but you want to scale it up to show impact at scale, that could be a concept. But as I've said before, don't write anything until you've spoken to one of my colleagues. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, please. Hello. Um, my name is uh, Raphael, and I'm working for INP, an impact investor uh, dedicated to financing and support assessments in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, my question is, thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, my question is, uh, you, you, you have to engage... Uh, several hundred uh, million of, of dollars or billions. Uh, is there a minimum amount uh, for a project? Is there a maximum percentage GCF can fund uh, in a project? And uh, what is the average uh, timeline um, from origination to, well, to the launch of the project? My very politically correct answer would be depends. But um, we, we have um, done small projects as well as big projects. Uh, depending on the context, we, um, in fact, the Blue Green Bank, which was mentioned by our opening speaker, Alexa, this morning, our investment's only $15 million. But the impact it will create after our investment's done and others have come in is way beyond that $15 million can be, right? So we've actually helped create an institution in a country. So it's not necessarily the ticket size that will determine. It's what climate impact that you're trying to achieve and what our size of money will actually enable that to do. So that's where we look at uh, most likely. In terms of how long the cycle would be, I would say a typical cycle, if you have submitted a cold concept note, as, as I call it, a cold call. If it's a cold call, it could take anywhere between two and a half to three years. But if you've worked with us on co-creating 
talking to us first and then come to us, then our uh, approval timelines are very, uh, I would say between 12 to 15 months. But it would all depend on you know, whether what you're targeting is really what GCF is looking for. So as I said always, please have a conversation uh, before you start doing anything. If it's not a good fit and you have submitted us a concept note, and this is the real, um, I would say, I hate to use this word, but it's a wrinkle, I would say. Okay, but for want of a better, better politically correct word. It's a wrinkle on the GCF's processes. We don't have the ability to say no. So if you submit something to us, we will end up giving you comments. And that will not necessarily tell you that this doesn't fit. And it's a waste of your time and it's a waste of my time. And waste of all of our time. So that, that's why I say have a conversation. Because time is precious. It's investable, right? So let's, let's work together to make sure we are the right fit as partners. Yes, please. Can we have the mic here, second row? I'm sorry, I'm making you run around. Maybe we need another mic in the room to cover this room. Great. Thank you very much. My name is Chris Foote. I'm Pestle Africa. Just a very simple question. On the continuum of projects you invest in, from the carbon side to the biodiversity side, if a project is more on the biodiversity side, would that be considered eligible, or you would be entirely purely relating to climate-related impact? Oh, we will have to look at, we have, uh, as I said, we are climate first. If, only, if it only has conservation uh, impact, then we would not look at it. It has to have a climate impact. It can also have core benefits of biodiversity. But for us to be investing in it, our first port of call is climate impact. Yes, please. The mic's behind you, sir. It's coming to you. All right. Um, my name is Humphrey. I'm with Cross Boundary Energy Access. We are a mini grid financing so, platform. Could you speak closer to the mic, please? Yep. My name is Humphrey. I'm with Cross Boundary Energy Access. We're a mini grid financing platform. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I think two quick things. One is you mentioned the importance of speaking to you and your colleagues. It'd be really helpful if some of them would raise their hand. I'd really like to meet with them, but I can't tell who's who. Um, so we'd like to chat. Um, and then secondly, you mentioned the project-specific approach, which, uh, again, that sounds extremely interesting. Uh, congratulations on launching that. Um, the timelines you mentioned earlier, are those specific to you know, the, the usual accredited entity approach or also similar for the project-specific approach? Thank you. Um, that's a very good reminder. May I, if my colleagues are in the room, would you um, mind standing up? Daniel? Nestin, Yun, Marshmi, I can't spot anybody else. So that, that table. There are a few others. Uh, we are about 12 of us here. So, well, I'll definitely make sure that they are visible. Most of the people on the moderating on the panels will be one of my colleagues. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, the second question you asked about uh, timelines for project specific accreditation approach, whether it would be different from a regular accreditation thing. The first half of the accreditation timeline uh, will be definitely cut short because the accreditation process is different right now. It's just limited to the project. I don't have enough body of data now to give numbers because this is a pilot that's been launched this year. We haven't done any project approval so far through the PSAA route. However, if you're interested in it, I would really encourage you to attend uh, tomorrow's uh, conversation on this one because that will go into the details of what we look at it and how we will approach the screening process, et cetera. Thank you. Good one. People with green tags is, are my colleagues. Everybody else has a different color tag, so that's the way to know who, who to talk to. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Okay. One final comment or a question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tim Rand from Risk Core Ventures. I uh, just had a question on the trends and concepts you were seeing over the last eight years across the four focal areas I think you mentioned. What would you like to see more of in the next you know, cycle? 
Well, in terms of trends, in the first strategic period, most of them were renewable energy projects uh, with a smattering of some uh, end use energy efficiency. Uh, we've seen a greater diversity in this second strategic period. Uh, we've done a lot more adaptation this time. We've done a lot more on the, on, even on the mitigation side, we've done a lot more on building efficiencies. We've done a lot more risk taking uh, this time around. We've done a lot more creative uh, financial structures and de-risking this time around. We want, what do we want to scale up? Our nature and biodiversity, uh, we want to scale that up. That's still not um, enough. On the agri-food and human health resilience systems, not enough. On the energy transition supply side, uh, we still get a lot of traditional projects, but not what we would call really catalytic projects that would change a certain way of doing business. And that's what we're really looking for, something transformative. And that would be really something that I would look for on the energy side. And on the um, demand side, we're really looking at scaling up the uh, industry, the uh, decarbonization of the industry, as well as of the transport, the harder to abate sectors, as they call it. So that's what we are looking for in the 2024 to 2027 period. I think this would be, oh, I'll take okay. one final, yeah. final uh -huh. comment. Yeah, thanks a lot for the presentation. My name is uh, Jasper Onyango. I'm the Regional Technical Assistant Manager for the Private Infrastructure Development Group. Uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask is uh, on the accreditation process and uh, the origination and the incubation program that you run. Uh, in Africa, the reality is that uh, almost 80% of the projects fail or collapse the concept stage because you find that some of them don't have the capacity to push them from concept, maybe to business case and to feasibility. So there's a lot of being needed. And uh, I just wanted to know from a GCF whether at some point in time you have some facility. Oh, okay, I'm back. Yeah, so I just wanted to, want to ask from the GCF uh, perspective, whether you have a pool of funds which at times can be dedicated to handhold or support these startups to a level of compliance. Yeah, because uh, as I mentioned, the reality in Africa, if we are waiting for these projects or startups to comply, for them to access capital, then we'll never solve any problem because nobody will be compliant. And uh, secondly, as I mentioned, I am, we manage a pool of uh, grants funding for Africa for early stage projects preparation. Out of interest, I just want to know whether GCF is always open to co-fund some of the setup project preparation facilities. Thank you. Um, on the first question, um, within there are two ways that GCF provides grant funding for capacity building. One is through the readiness window. As I mentioned, my colleague from the Division of Country Programming will be speaking about it in great detail and how that uh, uh, people here who are interested can take advantage of it. She'll be speaking tomorrow, so please do attend that. We also have, uh, within each of our funding proposal, built-in technical assistance to be able to comply with GCF's uh, compliance requirements. Uh, so if, if the, especially on the direct access entities and local entities who may not have the capacity, we do uh, support that. Uh, we have uh, delivery partners uh, of different, uh, uh, with different qualifications who can support them as well. So there are different ways GCF approaches uh, capacity building, and my colleague, um, Zendala, would be the best person to answer that, so I encourage you to attend that. On the question of whether GCF would co-fund an existing fund, let's talk about it outside. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, this, I think this is a great moment then to call this uh, session to a close. Thank you so very much. Uh, this was a one-on-one, -on -one, a teaser into how to do business with GCF. And I hope to see more of you become more interested in working with us. Thank you very much.